Good Monday evening, everybody. Scott Stevens here with a look at the bi-weekly show. Twice a week, Mondays and Wednesdays, 6 o'clock we do this. I do this. Uh, other, other little perspective on some other topics coming from uh, climate and weather background, but also being in news. You, and a part of my nature is just the curiosity thing of what's really going on behind the scenes. This gives me a little bit of an opportunity to talk about some of these other things that are going on uh, locally, uh, nationally, and then even globally. All right, I kind of want to uh, be, discuss something that has been in the air for months, if not years, and that is the topic of dissent. Uh, dissent. When I was being introduced to news of 10, 15, 20 years old, more likely the teens, though, uh, dissent was something that I came across uh, that the news presented us because that was li- largely the uh, the approved source of information at that point in time was through the network media and then through the Time magazine, U.S. News and World Report, Newsweek magazine, all of those corporate controlled assets. So when dissent was presented, it was as resistors to communism, to other forms of government. And for me, that's what a dissenter was, was someone who would protest against largely at the point in time, uh, Soviet occupation of e- a Eastern Europe or by their own uh, by their own uh, citizens inside the nation itself. Although rarely did we hear those stories get out because of censorship. And of course, that was happening in many, many other nations. It's just that with my myopic eyes and we're all looking at the world through our own myopic eyes, through what we can see, what information we can bring in is always going to be limited. And we have to accept that, that no one outside of a deity is going to have the broadest point of view, the all encompassing point of view to see all of the moving parts that we in our own lives in ways are dissenting. We make decisions to change the course of actions. And as we mature, we consume more content, we grow a little life wisdom, we tend to dissent a little more. We tend to either agree, oh, that, that's within the realms of acceptable uh, range of experience, or otherwise we step back and look at the other side and go, no, no, no. by golly, there's something wrong with that. And, and that's that I object to that. I want to change that. How can I see that injustice and how can I change that? And that's where we are, not inside closed systems like the Chinese inside of China or or Russian citizens inside the old Soviet uh, empire, the old Soviet bloc. No, that, that has changed. That's fallen apart 30 years ago now. But still, the Chinese are left inside their box and the Vietnamese have their own communist system, but with somewhat more freedom. You don't have the freedom to of religion that does not exist in Vietnam and it definitely does not exist in China. So we've got these dissenters who would like to have more freedom, freedoms to make their own choice. Good to see you guys on over there. A few of you on board. All right. So we'll start this little slideshow. It's not as long as some of my other ones. So we'll see if I just spend more time on it or we just blaze on through a, because it's Monday and I'm sure it's evening time. You've got families to be with, right? Come on now. All right. So are we dissidents or are we just following the path of least resistance? And before anybody were to take up arms, doing nothing is often the path of least resistance. Just to do nothing, to go with the flow, to not make any waves, to not bring any attention to oneself is the path of least resistance. Now, there are other kinds of life, maybe in the higher realms where you get these messages and you follow those messages. And and, in that way, that would be the path of least resistance to use the highest quality information that you have available to yourself and then act upon it. Otherwise, down here, it's the blind leading the blind. It's the passions leading one forward through to the next experience. So are we dissidents or are we following the path of least resistance? Let's kind of go on through this dissident. Dissident definition is a disagreeing, especially with an established religious or political system, organization, or belief, how to use dissidents in a sense. And growing up, I think we all were presented a religious belief some continue to adhere to even through adulthood and will likely die with that same belief intact. I know our parents would like that. And many of us were like, no, 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 no. There is more to this life than that experience or that belief system that was presented to me on Sundays. 
and you leave the church, and then it all goes back to a free-for-all. So religion was a big reason to become a, 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 a dissident. So a dissident by Wikipedia broadly defined as a person who actively challenges an established doctrine, policy, or institution. In a religious context, the word has been used since at least the 18th century and in political sense since 1940, coinciding with the rise of totalitarian systems, especially the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and Saudi Arabia. Now, I could expand totalitarian systems to include monarchies, especially as we go farther back in time, monarchies. And then that monarch, in some ways, I guess it would be a theology system if the Pope ruled, or if there was a religious system that is in place, a totalitarian religious system in place. And there are many countries in the Middle East where that king is then subjected or tied to that religion upon which the system operates, the system answers to. And many times those monarchies are not necessarily benevolent. So dissent, when I was you know, coming of age in the 80s, it was by definition a disagreement, especially about official sele- uh, suggestion or plan or popular belief. Now, dissent under Stalin was just dangerous. You knew the consequences for descending, offering it off a different point of view or simply not agreeing or going along with the party line was dangerous. Many, many millions lost their lives. China, Cambodia. India, uh, maybe not so much India, but uh, certainly in the Soviet Union, that happened. We ended up with these dictators, and it was dangerous to be uh, in, in dissent. So once the infallibility of the communist leadership, the uh, uh, the Communist Party leadership, they were more willing to express their opinions because the risk to their well-being was lessened somewhat because they had company. It wasn't just one lone person standing up against that point of view. So there's no evidence of widespread public dissatisfaction, even though they may have grumbled about everyday problems like food shortages, but political dissent was rare. Now, we can evolve this dissent into dissension. Disagreement produces debate, but dissent produces dissension. Dissent, which comes from the Latin dis and sentire, means originally to feel apart from others. I can agree with that. I think all of us at some point in our life you looked either around at the friends, acquaintances, maybe even family members, and you're like, ah, I'm not I'm I I'm more dislike them than I am like them. And so we're choosing to become a minority. We're choosing to dissent from the discussions that are happening within that group, within their belief systems, within how they would respond to a threat or 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 an advantage that would be coming their way. So people who have uh, who disagree have an agar argument, but people who dissent often have a quarrel. People may disagree, and both may count themselves in the majority. But a person who dissents is, by definition, in a minority. A liberal society thrives on disagreement, but is killed by dissension. Disagreement is the lifeblood of democracy, and dissension is its cancer. And from that statement, if you accept it to be a fact or a postulate or maybe even a principle upon which to act or to frame a a viewpoint, the world appears to uh, have evolved into uh, from the disagreement about even just politics or climate or so many other uh, topics, education, uh, medicine. There's so many places to where we could have a disagreement with the the. the system that is in place. So we have uh, become a disagreement, I would have to suggest, has become a dissension. And there are many, many topics upon which this dissension appears to be in place. All right. If you go to the Southwest Desert, this being the United States, and catch 100 red fire ants as well as, say, 100 black large ants, and then put them in the jar first, nothing will happen. However, If you violently shake the jar and dump them back on the ground, the ants will fight until eventually they kill each other. The thing is, the red ants think the black ants are the enemy and vice versa, when in reality, the real enemy is the person who shook the jar. This is exactly what is happening in society today. Liberal versus conservative, black versus white, pro-mask versus anti-mask. The real question is, that we need to be asking ourselves, who is shaking the jar and why? 
can we get to that point? All right. Now, I found this picture today, and I thought it was very, very curious that we have two beings which appear to be on the throne. So two different leaders, different heads. So they have one with a snake and one with a gator. So we have different entities, both reptilian in nature. However, their left hand is shaking the other left hand or, or their other hand. They're, they're in, in, a, in an embrace. And yet with the other hand, we have, pup, we have puppet strings, marionette strings to the leadership. And then that leadership has puppet strings to the ones down below while we are fighting a battle amongst each other, and then what is holding it all up? And of its course, the people of all colors, of all sexes, of all creeds, underneath the leadership of these two entities that have, obviously, because it's, we're, de- we're denoting the shaking of the hand. And what is the difference from what is happening today? Are we really that much different than 5,000 years ago? Or is the game always been the same. Oh, you don't need to fight them. You just need to convince the masked people that the unmasked people are trying to kill everyone. And the pitchforks come out. So then we've got a mask for spray paint and a mask for asbestos and a mask for mining. And of course, as we've talked about in some of the other shows, a mask for the deadliest virus in history. Not really a mask at all. So what are we, what are we really talking about? So when we get to the point of descent, we really need to Rain in those horses and be aware, do proper research of which sides debate that side's goals that you are choosing or have chosen to fuel. An argument has to have two sides. And you even have to wonder if there is a winning side at all, or if we are just fighting because we're being agitated by both of those leaders who behind the the curtain continue to shake each other's hands because none of that really affects them. It doesn't impact them. We have to be aware of this before choosing a side. And this is where ultimately discernment comes in. Is it best to just stay removed from the situation or is your life and liberty so threatened that we must engage it? And that is largely, in my eyes, the unknown. At what point does this disagreement become a Germany in 1940, where then it becomes truly life-threatening? And and even in history, 70 plus years later, we're like, why didn't they leave? Why didn't they get the itch to do something about the situation? All right. uh, The general population doesn't know what's happening. It doesn't even know that it doesn't know. Probably no truer words have been spoken in some time, and that's by design. Look up here. Let's go back up to the the Egyptians. How many levels down below are the people squabbling over the issue, and what is the argument even about when the leaders are still having their own strings pulled? How far up the chain of command do we really need to go before we find the truth, before we discover what is really happening? All right. And then even once dissent does show up, it becomes the crab in the pot. You have a different opinion, and yet those around you choose to try to keep you conforming or the other, vice versa. The mob can then become the majority. And then what happens? Then is the safety or is the safety of these two other persons at risk? And this uh, has come up recently, uh, so says Churchill. The best uh, argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. And this comes back to information. If people had all of the information of the situation, the scenario that they find themselves, that they find their families and that they find their nation and, and then the planet involved in, how can they be expected to make a proper decision if they're not fully informed. That means that every single voter, by definition, becomes a low information voter because we don't know where we don't have the context upon which the decisions were being made to ask exists. We're not given the full scenario, the full situation. And that becomes the challenge. And I, I, I can't even say the fault of the press because it would 
inquire, uh, will require so many briefings to bring someone up to date. It's interesting that once someone in politics leaves office, and I'm not quite sure at what level this happens, but it has, you know, it, you have to be fairly high up that you get briefings, intelligence briefings, the daily briefing from the government, you get them for life. You have earned that right to be engaged and in the loop. And it's an interesting thing that if if the government then goes in a direction you're not comfortable with and you're still getting briefings that you can you can talk about it. And then you also have to query the quality of the briefing. Because if you've trusted that briefer to give you the full story and you're so busy, you don't have the time to to you know, go out and do all your research yourself. You rely on these briefers that even then you can get a story tilted to you or slanted to you in a, in a very colored way. And this just comes back to the press and also to the media that the surest way to corrupt a youth is to instruct him to hold in higher esteem those who think alike rather than those who think differently. Because you're not challenged if you're only surrounded by those who think like you. And I just had this flash of growing up in a church, in a religion, where they all thought alike. They all had similar experiences, and the structure of the religion mandated that you had at least three, four, five meetings weekly upon which to mold your thought processes. And one of the other processes uh, of that was simply to follow the laws of the land. Upon that, you know, the, the, the church was allowed to function. So there's the dogs, and they're objecting to something going on out there. So if we have people that think alike, that act alike, that behave alike, then that allows for the comfort of the rich, and that, that will automatically mean that you've got an abundant supply of those that can be herded, those that can be controlled. Then it comes back into Noam Chomsky. The smartest way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the accepted, uh, the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but then allow a very lively debate inside that spectrum. So we could talk about this and this, and we can have talk shows endlessly talking about these two topics. But then outside of this, everything else goes. Everything else exists. And that's how to keep people from asking the questions that maybe those in power would not rather like to answer, that they don't have to answer if they're never asked the question. And this is uh, controlling the press room of the White House, controlling the press in the Capitol, controlling the press. So that if there is a topic that is worthy, absolutely worthy of discussion, that the press, by self-censoring, simply will not ask the hard questions because, God forbid, they lose access to the White House press room or to congressmen. And so there's this self-censoring, there's this club, and we can't do something that would in inhibit, restrict engender or uh, endanger our access to the club of information. So the smartest way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion. Watch an evening news. I don't care which network. Watch it and see if there is a theme running through every single story except one. And do that for a month. Every single story will have some thread run through it, some part of an agenda that they were delivered by talking points every morning, and then every story looped back to that piece, that little bit of information that they wanted to make sure you heard, not once, not twice, but it was important enough to be dropped into every single story. The power of dissenting opinions, especially with a judge on the bench, and this is relevant because of, uh, of Ruth's recent passing, Mrs. Uh, Ginsburg, dissenting opinions are important because their reasoning may become the basis of future majority decisions. A minority opinion is still written down. It becomes the dissenting opinion and doesn't become law but it becomes a foundation for the potential of future law. 
it was worthy enough. It was an important enough piece that it became, and especially if that judge was the one to write the dissenting opinion. So as a society and views of the judges change, so then can legal opinion. Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 led to Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. That was nearly 60 years difference. 60 years that that dissenting opinion existed on the record as, not as law, but as an opinion before society slowly changed it. Three generations had to pass before that could become law. And even in some places, 1974, 1984, there were still senators talking about racial jungles because of this dissenting opinion. So we don't want to become... We, it's okay to be dissenters, but to cause dissension. Dissension ultimately leads to a breakdown of some sort. That breakdown can grow. It can become infecting, especially if a broad portion of the population is sympathetic to the cause. And if that ever becomes the case, the majority becomes dissenters, then there was a problem within society, within governance, within money, within jobs, within equity, for a lot longer than just what's happening right now. These would be long-standing grievances. And the Constitution absolutely gives us the right to address the government and to ask for redress, to ask for changes. I think that began. And we're beginning to see this process maturing and this election, either side is asking for changes. And I have this sense that it's going to take an outside party, almost a mediator of sorts, to bring about a unity once again. That it doesn't matter which D or R behind that person who wins name. It's not going to be enough of a change to stop the dissent to allow for those that are now dissenting to feel comfortable and once again giving their power away. Because that's absolutely what voting does, is you're giving your power away, you're choosing sides. And as we know that there are, are flaws, there are issues within that system. So even if you vote and end up in the majority, obviously that doesn't mean that you will see redress of your claims redress to the problems that have been presented to the government. So I have an, a hope, a prayer, that out of this chaos, which is just barely scratching the surface, because this is nothing like a revolution, what's going on now today is still very ordered, still very regimented. Even though we've seen some chaos in the economy, there are big, big changes which remain just around the corner. Remember, this is still October. Election is what would be two days after an election in a month from now. I'll be curious to see what topics we will have chosen, which October surprises emerge, which parties will give in a little bit to the other so that we may find a little bit of common ground so that the next generation potentially will have it just a little bit better than ours. The most badass historical quote ever. British officer, you French fight for money while we British fight for honor. Robert Surkoff, sir, a man fights for what he lacks the most. Think about that. All men desire peace, but very few desire those things that make for peace. This one takes a little bit more to think about. What could change? What would have to change inside of the system? so that peace might reign once again. Even if we're not at war, that doesn't mean that inside these nations, which aren't supporting or sending out standing armies, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's peace at home. It might be tranquil for a moment, but that doesn't mean there aren't problems that the stew on the stove isn't still on low, that these problems haven't been completely resolved. All right, so we have two sides of sorts. One asking, just leave us alone. Let us be, allow us our freedom, our liberty to, to be entrepreneurs, to, to explore the country, to travel without 
worrying about confiscation, about, uh, you know, driving across the state and having your assets taken from you. Just leave us alone. And then there's still the other side, which sees the evils inside the moneyed system. I don't think any would disagree with that, but please, please, please take care of us all. There's truth in both of these. And there has to be someone that can stand in the middle to where we can be left alone so that, hey, we can take care of ourselves. Since there are too many processes, too many laws, literally buildings full of code that you and I will never read and never need to read because they only apply in the most rare of situations. And then an evolved society, a mature society, one that values its citizens, its residents, needs fewer laws, not more laws, because the people have matured to the point that they can respect one another, that there's a little bit of honor that they have fought for, that they're still carrying that honor inside inside themselves, and they treat each other, they treat their fellow human beings They treat their pets, they treat their animals, they treat the environment, those that they randomly come across as fellow human beings, so that these two sides, the ones that ask just to leave us alone because they see the overreach and those that see the unfairness in the system because it's difficult to take care of oneself when the education we're getting is not really an education, but an indoctrination, that the game is rigged for those who already have, rather than those who want to provide for themselves outside of an education given to them, or that you have now gone deeply into debt, and now you've got to service that debt. There has to be a middle road. And never be deceived that the rich will allow you to vote away their wealth. We may occupy Wall Street, but that doesn't mean that they will willingly give those who, in many, many ways, didn't work for that. And the system isn't fair. Life is not fair. And honestly, it never will be fair. But we should have opportunities. And that's what we are asking for in, the, in, the, in this side, the opportunity to use our gifts that we were born with, the time that we have, to make ourselves and those around us better. And if that uplifts all, then so be it. And that is all that most are asking for. And then then we can occupy Wall Street, and I believe I have this sense that its days are numbered. They've chosen a system that is unsustainable. And history has shown that fiat monies are unsustainable, especially once, uh, I don't want to say the spirit of the people are broken, but they're wounded, absolutely wounded because of the mistreatment across the generations. How many generations can you ask your sons, your fathers to go to war and now your daughters and to be gone? And a percentage of them never come home. You get a flag at the doorstep a plaque, an honor. But those that do come home carry those wounds forevermore. At what point do we say enough? Enough. So every man is guilty of all the good he didn't do. And I agree and I disagree. I disagree. Because the flavor for this also goes to to the BLM movement where silence is violence. There's a time when that is true. But there's also a time when silence is safety. And that's where we're back to discernment. At what point do we choose to speak? At what point does action become the only course of action? All of us, I think at one point or another, will be faced with that and see Thomas Jefferson's words that dissent is the highest form of patriotism. But we're back to the beginning. We have to know What is behind the movement? What is that goal? What is that highest goal that we are searching for? If you're going to spill blood for children for the next generation, it has to be something more than oil or for bankers. And that is the the, the purpose of the Occupy Wall Street is to take down that system so that the other side can then thrive. And then together, we all uplift ourselves. 
So we're living in a culture entirely hypnotized by the illusion of time in which the so-called present moment is felt as nothing but an infinitesimal hairline, truly a hairline between the causative past and the absorbingly important future. We have no present. Our consciousness is almost completely preoccupied with memory of the past and then expectation of the future. We do not realize that there never was, is, nor will be any other experience than the present experience. We are therefore out of touch with reality. That's all Alan Watts. And this is what it's coming back to, is that we're so a either worried about the past, living with the things that we should have done, or imagining a future that we continue to desire. So we uh we find ourselves in the, I'm going to come over here to the comments. So where is the upcoming vision yet to be defined? What's the compelling vision yet to be defined? And that is for me, the $64,000, the $1 million, the $24 trillion question. What's the compelling vision? Because with that vision, a middle road, I think can be defined. And once that vision is defined, We can peel away some from this side, some from this side, and then a movement can begin because right now the middle road to me appears as if it's just the high ground between the dugouts in a World War I battlefield where you're just tossing gas or you're up and you're shooting. It's it's an ugly, ugly scene. And if we can, you know, we're, we're polarizing so much that the sides are coming apart that there has to be this void. This middle ground gets larger and larger and larger because the polarization is happening. But if we're only listening to ourselves and those who think like us, we'll never be able to bridge that gap between the two separate ideologies. And this is what I hope that we can find a person who can articulate that vision that will appeal to not just 51%, not just a majority of the electoral college, but to us, and not even as Americans, but as human beings. And if this country is to have that Lady Liberty, is to be that light, that beacon that drew people, A, of means, because they could get here, but also of talent, of skill, of ability, of the ability to to support themselves and to contribute to what arguably was a, a pretty great nation for a time. To become that once again to the world is going to take a very, very different agenda than the one that we have now been presented for November 3rd. We make America great again or... I'm not quite sure what the other one is. It's not, I'm, I know it's greater than malarkey, but that's the only word that comes to mind. But that we all have this in common being that we're in a human body and that we can find that ground once again. I know it exists. And maybe that's partly of what we're here to do on these shows and, and to get input from you and to have those discussions, to have those difficult discussions with those that we disagree with. And when that happens, you can make those disagreeable discussions, not with enemies on the other side, but with newfound friends. And with their with that renewed friendship, then their skills, their abilities, their talents, their dreams and visions can be all of ours once again. So that's kind of where I am on this day when I talk about dissent. And we can build it back better. We can. (laughs) My God, look at us. We're amazing, amazing spiritual beings. We have that talent. We have that skill. When uh, President Obama wanted to end the developing hysteria around Ebola, what happened was an abolition of all news surrounding the disease around the infection. And that took the wind out of it and they could deal with it behind the scenes and then, and then end it. Maybe it's time that we had a media timeout and then we could get some space to think, to contemplate, to imagine rather than always being told how to think, 
how to imagine that we can get that capability, that skill back, that imagination back so we can see and imagine much, much farther than what we are being fed on a daily, if not hourly, or even a minute by minute basis. All right. Thanks for stopping in guys. Uh, thought provoking. Yeah, we have to, we have to, it's, it's truly, it's truly, uh, up to us. And Ryan, if this is you, because I can't see, and I didn't open another tab, that's up to us. It's up to us to come together and create that future. Because if anything has taught us that it's not within the realm, that's not within the capability of a political party, they can start it. But those that jump on that bandwagon, there's positions of money and of power that sit there waiting for those that take power. And that is a very, very, uh, I almost want to say corrosive, abrasive, dangerous place for a lot of people to go because of the power that is then given them to use. And without the proper wisdom and humility, it can be profoundly misused. All right, guys, I'll hit you on Wednesday. Oh my goodness, what are we going to talk about? I had an idea, but I don't dare go there with that just yet. Just yet. Some crazy things are happening and um, I don't know. Either way, it's going to be good. I'll catch you on Wednesday. Until then, tomorrow we'll uh, take a look at Tropical Storm Delta, soon to be Hurricane Delta. Will they retire that name if this is a big, fascinating storm that gets lots of press or because it's an alphabet letter that we'll just use it again and again? I know we haven't been through Delta since uh, 2005, but eh, it's a question I was thinking to myself. All right. uh, Where are you guys coming from? All right. All right. All right. I'll catch you tomorrow at five o'clock for check on weather and then Wednesday at six o'clock for another perspective. In the meantime, keep looking up.